Namaste and good morning everybody. Very auspicious day, it is Durga Puja, the worship of God as the Divine Mother. I sometimes say, I'm called upon to introduce Hinduism to schools here, to school students. And I say one way of understanding Hinduism is to say that to, for every question the answer is yes and no. So for example, do Hindus believe in God? Yes and no. <laughs> because there are systems in Hinduism which do not talk about God, you know, like Sankhya. And, um, is God male? Yes and no. So God is male with a male form and with a, fem a female form, the divine feminine, and beyond gender. Um, is God with form? Yes. So uh, you go to a Hindu temple, you will see <laughs> endlessly so. And no, God is formless. So the ultimate reality is conceived of and understood in multiple ways, in a vast spectrum of ways with various names, various forms. And one of the most powerful and most ancient um, conceptions of God in Hinduism has been God as mother. We know, we studied the Indus Valley Civilization, you know, in uh, India, Saraswati Valley Civilization. And there, among the oldest, most ancient icons, that, uh, to archaeological finds, are figurines of the mother goddess. I still remember there were those pictures in our history textbook. So I was thinking, what should I talk about today? And uh, it's Durga Puja. So I thought, I'll just talk about Durga Puja. And what I'll do today is, one of our um, very senior monks was there, Swami Bodhatmananda. Not Bodhananda, who was here in the Vedanta Society. Bodhatmananda, Bhava Maharaj. He's not really too well known to the public outside, not well known at all to the public outside. But among the monks, everybody knows his name because he was the first principal, the founder of what we call the monastic training center. So he trained generations of monks. All the senior monks in our order now have been trained by him. So he was a monk who was also a monk maker. You know? <laughs> Swami Bodhatmananda, legendary person. I mean, I, I, it was long before my time, long years before my time. But all the senior monks they have seen him, Swami Chetananji, Swami Sarvadevanji, they were all trained by him. Um, so uh, he wrote an article about Durga Puja in Bengali many, many years ago, decades ago. So I found that old article, it's very informative. So what I'm saying today is almost all of it is based on that source. I'm just taking off from what he has given, the information that he has given in that Bengali article written decades ago, Durga Puja. Um, it is a saying in India that Durga Puja is the Ashwamedha Yajna of this day and age. And what is an Ashwamedha Yajna? You know, the Vedic spirituality, the Vedic religion, the way people performed rituals in Vedic times was the fire sacrifice, Yajna the fire sacrifice. And the fire sacrifices were elaborate affairs. None more so than the Ashwamedha Yajna, the famous uh, horse sacrifice. And it's a very elaborate aff affair, uh, um, uh, but none of that remains now. Those things have disappeared over the centuries and millennia. The Yajnas themselves have been, uh, the fire sacrifices have been replaced by the Puja. For example, what we did today, a Puja a worship of a deity. That's what defines modern Hinduism. And that happened over a period of maybe um, 2,000 or more years. Of course, nothing really dies in India or in Hinduism. So the old Vedic fire rituals are still preserved. For example, in any major puja, there will be a homa. We all know. So even in Durga Puja, on Navami, the ninth day, there is a homa at the end of the puja. So which is basically the Vedic fire ritual itself, continuing in that form. In fact, even when we do a puja, you will notice the first thing that a pujari, that the priest does is light a lamp. And that lamp signifies the Vedic fire. <laughs> so among all these Vedic fire rituals, the most extensive, most complicated, most uh, uh, resource intensive was the Ashwamedha Yajna. And because of that, complicated, 
uh, resource intensive and uh, you know it's sort of vast that's why the durga puja is compared to the uh, ashwamedha yagya so if you have uh, the m most elaborate ritual today it would be the durga puja in its various uh, iterations not just the complexity of the ritual the, or the greatness of the result phala that means result also is supposed to be very great but also if you look at what it does it involves not just a priest uh, but it involves a whole host you will see in the belur mat durga puja if you see the 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 live live stream you will see there is the priest and there is what is called a tantra dharak the person literally means the the uh, the one who holds the thread so the puja is conducted by that, that uh, it's, it's usually a senior swami and then there's a host of people who are supporting the puja in the our main monastery the puja if you see uh, it will be monks and uh, the novices brahmacharis but in the pujas durga pujas which are conducted in houses for example it will be every member of the household uh, the um, the lady of the household the children and everybody will be pitching in to support the puja and then in a wider circle it will involve all sorts of people from the artisans who crafted the image of durga uh, to the artisans who built the elaborate stage and the pandal and you know the decorations to the musicians there are a variety of you know, the huge drums which are played um, to those confectioners who will supply a vast range of sweets and delicacies to be offered to the mother there's so many people who are like every section of the society is involved in the puja and the materials offered to the mother so for example water is offered in every puja in every worship water is offered among men water and fruits and uh, leaves and flowers but the scale is altogether different here so in durga puja water from the rivers from the ganga and other rivers the water from the ocean uh, they'll be gathered together and offered uh, earth is used as an offering and earth has to be from uh, every section of the city from the mountains so it's from so the materials honey and milk and what not uh, enormous range of materials are used there um, and its forms across india it's there's a central worship in the eastern part of india in bengal um, durga puja but also all throughout india navaratri that's uh, that's the other form of durga puja there is uh, dashera in the north of india uh, there is a, a chandi puja in some parts of india all of these are variations of the same durga puja so the ashwamedha yagya of this day and age but it's also very ancient it goes all the way back to the vedas the most ancient texts that we find in all the living religions of the world in the rigveda itself you find the devi sukta which i spoke about last year the hymn to the devi and the devi sukta where the rishi rishika the the lady who is enlightened one she identifies herself with the reality of this entire universe with the foundation the source of this entire universe and the power behind this universe and she says aham aham rudre bhi vasu bhi charami i am the power i means not this person this particular rishi rishika but i the divine mother am the power behind this entire earth there she reveals herself as as the very existence of the universe as the power behind this universe as the source of all protection all blessings and he says those who worship me to whatever they want i grant them this one i make this one a knower of brahman that one i make that one an intellect to dominate the ages that one i give dom a dominion over the earth hmm. so whatever they want i i make them tam tam ugram karomi i make them excel in this universe and so on and what beautiful poetry there and she says at the beginning of the universe when the worlds were born when the new worlds were new born i blew through this universe like a wind blows through this earth vata eva pravavami arabhamana bhuvanani when the universe was just being born i swept through the universe like a breeze uh, so that's the source of the idea of durga 
even the mantra used you know it comes from the upanishads for the, you know every deity in hinduism has what is called a gayatri which is used to praise the deity and to connect with that power so durga the gayatri for durga that om katyayanaya vidmahe kanyakumari dhimahi tanno durgi prachodayat so the commentator sayana there in sanskrit he comments that word durgi means durga which is so there durga is referred to there is a beautiful story in the keno upanishad all the way back to the upanishads in the keno upanishad um, she makes her appearance uh, and there the word uma is used uma in this context in the united states and in the modern world they immediately they'll think of uma thurman <laughs> <laughs> and she's named after uh, durga her father um, who is actually a very noted scholar of buddhism and very close to the dalai lama robert thurman he's right here in uh, colombia and he says sort of wistfully they all know me as uma's father <laughs> <laughs> and that's true too in the story of durga uma is the daughter of the himalayas so the himalayas are known as durga's father so <laughs> they get their identity from uma whether it's robert thurman here or the himalayas in india but the story goes like this and i often love uh, you know hearing it and telling it in the original sanskrit a certain rhythm to it as you will see so i'll narrate the story and the point of the story is at the end durga makes her appearance uma makes her appearance um brahma devebhyo vijigye tasya brahmano vijaye deva amayanta ta aikshanta asmakam evayam vijayo asmakam evayam mahimeti in ancient times Brahman won a great victory for the the devas, the gods, and he defeated the demons. And you know, always we hear these stories when we were kids. We used to read Amar Chitra Katha as a kid, and so the the gods in the heavens would always defeat. You know, there would be fights, and with the help of God with capital G, usually Vishnu, they would defeat the demons. So in one of these battles, Brahman won a great victory for the devas. and uh, the devas were glorified by this victory of brahman but they made a big mistake they didn't know that it is brahman the ultimate reality god who has won this victory for us they thought asmakam evam vijayo it is our victory uh, asmakam evam mahimeti this is our glory remember what's going on here it's not just a fable it's not just a myth in vedanta the devas are the powers of our sense organs so the power to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and who powers all of this there's one power behind it all can open shit starts with that by what power are our senses lit up what gives us the experience of seeing or hearing or smelling or tasting or touching is consciousness brahman but the senses do not know it the mind doesn't know it right now the mind and the senses the sensory system this body this living body things I am the reality. Just as behind or deeper than this uh, body mind is awareness shining through the eyes and ears and in every experience but the body mind doesn't know that awareness. So this is the victory that awareness Brahman won for all of us giving us the experience of this universe. But we think I am seeing, I am hearing, I smell, I taste, I touch, I think. तद्धैषां विजग्यो तेभ्यो ह प्रादुर्भव प्रादुर्बभूव तन्नव्यजानत किमेतद् यक्षमिति सो ब्रह्मन न्यू दिस आई एम कोटिंग टू द ओरिजिनल केन उपनिषद ब्रह्मन न्यू दिस एंड आउट ऑफ कंपैशन फॉर दीस इग्नोरेंट फेलोस द द गॉड्स ही अपीयर्ड बिफोर देम एज अ स्ट्रेंज क्रीचर यक्ष एंड दे डिड नॉट नो व्हाट इट वाज तन्नव्यजानत किमेत यक्षमिति यक्ष इज दैट वंडरफुल क्रीचर व्हाट्स दिस वंडरफुल क्रीचर हाउ इज ब्रह्मन अपीयरिंग बिफोर ऑल ऑफ अस हियर द वर्ल्ड ऑफ फॉर्म्स एंड साउंड्स एंड स्मेल एंड टेस्ट द यूनिवर्स स्प्रेड आउट बिफोर अस इट इज ब्रह्मन इट इज गॉड बट वी वी थिंक इट्स अ मटेरियल यूनिवर्स वी डोंट नो व्हाट इट इज एक्चुअली एंड वी इन्वेस्टिगेटेड तन्नव्यजानत किमेत यक्षमिति 
So they wanted to find out. And you will see, each of the gods will try to go and try to find out what it is. What is this reality before us? Strange reality. And they'll fail one by one. And finally, one of them will succeed. We'll see how they succeed, how they come to become enlightened. But first, now the gods are going to try their best. You can think of gods as, you know, Marvel, DC superheroes. They all have their superpowers. So, te agni mabruvan jata veda etad vijani hi kimedam yakshamiti tateti. They, all the gods approached the god of fire, Agni. Oh Agni, oh Jata Veda, another name for Agni. Please go and find out what this strange creature before us is. And Agni says grandly, Tateti, Tathastu, let it be so. Then what happened? Tadabhyadravattam abhyavadat kosaiti Agnir va ahamasmiti abhravit Jata Veda va ahamasmiti So... Agni, the god of fire, rushed towards that yaksha, that being. And before he could find out, before he could interrogate that being, that being asked, yaksha, asked Agni, who are you? Who are you? And Agni replied grandly, I am Agni, the god of fire. I am Jataved, another the Vedic name for Agni. And then, um, and see, it's, the tables are turned. Brahman is asking them, who are you? Before they could ask Brahman, or they could ask the Yaksha. Thus means Tvai Kim Viryam Ityapidam Sarvam Daheyam Yadidam Prithivyamiti. Then uh, that Yaksha asks Agni, what is, what's your power? What's your superpower? You know, like a Superman, can you fly or can you spin a web like Spider Man? So, what's your power? And Agni says, All this you see, this, this world, this universe laid out before you? Yes. I can burn it into, into a crisp, just like that. That's my power. The yaksha put a piece of straw before Agni. Burn this. Show me. Tadupapriyaya sarva javena tanna shashaka dagdhum satateva nivavite naitada shakum vigyatum yadeta dyakshamiti. So Agni blazed forth, you know, lit up. And like a flamethrower, put all his fire and you know the fire of uh, of fission reaction, fusion reaction, what not, all sorts of fires. But he couldn't even ignite that little little uh, uh, piece of straw. It didn't even start smoking or anything like that. Just just lay there, <laughs> couldn't do anything. <laughs> and stunned, he retreated and came back to um, the other gods and said, "I couldn't find out." I could not find out what this, I couldn't ascertain the nature of this strange creature. And that's what happens. Brahman, the ultimate reality, consciousness, the witness consciousness, none of the sense organs can objectify it. The eyes cannot see it. The ears cannot hear it. The tongue cannot taste it. The, the organs of action, you cannot speak about it. The mind cannot conceive of it. Because why not? Why not? Is it very mysterious? No, no, no. It's not an object. That's all. It's the power behind all of them. It objectifies all of these, but they cannot objectify it. So it's like the torchlight, the flashlight. The light of that you can illumine the dark room, you can see everything. But now suppose you want to see the flashlight itself. If you keep turning the flashlight around trying to get the beam to focus on itself, it won't happen. It will always be behind the beam. So, um, then they said to Vayu, the god of, uh, of wind, the god of air, please go and find out what this yaksha is. Te vayam abhravit, te vayam abhruvan, vayavetad vijani hi kimetad yakshamiti, tateti, the god of air, of wind. They asked him, please find out who is this or what is the nature of this strange being. And he says, Tathastu, Tathastu, let it be so. And Tadabhyadravattam abhyavadat kosaiti. He rushed towards uh, that yaksha and immediately that yaksha, that strange being, asked him, who are you? <laughs> he can say like, sort of ironically, and, and you, who are you? 
And he replied grandly, Vayur va ahamasmiti, matarishva va ahamasmiti. I am Vayu, I am matarishva, that which moves through space, in the air. Tasmin stoi kim viryam, ityapidam sarvam adadeyam yadidam prithivyamiti. So he was asked, so what's your power? What's your superpower? And uh, why you say, well, you know this, you can see this world? Yes. I can blow away anything in this world. I can sweep away anything in this world. Tasmai trinam nidadho etadadatsveti. Piece of straw, put it before him. You see, it was already there. You see. You see that piece of straw? Yes. Try to blow it away. And so Agna, the Vayu, the god of wind, he, you can imagine, he huffed and puffed, <laughs> yeah, like trying to blow away <laughs> uh, as much as he could. You know, all the cyclones and the, the Ian, the, the, the uh, hurricane and the typhoons and um, all of that he spun up, but he couldn't touch that piece of straw. Tadupapriyaya sarva javena tanna shashakadatum sa tateva nivavrite naita dashakum vigyatum yadeta dyakshamiti. So he comes back. I'm drawing out the story too long, but I'm telling it as it is. <laughs> he comes back and tells the other gods, I couldn't find out what this uh, yaksha is. And then they go, turn to the king of the gods. So this is the climax of the story. They turn to the king of the gods, Indra. Ting Indra Mabruvan Maghavan, another name for Indra is Maghavan. Maghavan etad vijani hi kimeta dyakshamiti tateti. You should hear the, I'm translating and interrupting it, but if you, he, you should hear it in one flow, it's dramatic. And there's sheer vibrations of the story. Um, and Indra says, let it be so. Tadabhyadravat tasmatirodhade. So he rushed towards that being. That being didn't even speak to him, just vanished. <laughs> But this is a deep meaning here. It is the mind when it, it contemplates, who am I? And you find nothing there. Everything disappears, everything falls apart and shows, everything is revealed to be empty. Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam, shunyam. What does it mean? Not the body, not the senses, not the mind, none of it is I. They are all objects and they have no existence of themselves. They are all compounded. And so, so is there nothing? But I do exist. Then what am I? And Indra waits there. Satasmin nevakashe striyam ajagama bahushobhamanam umam haimavatim. And in that emptiness appeared this most glorious female form with all beauty and radiance and glory. Who was this? The daughter of the Himalayas, Uma. Umam haimavatim. A blazing form. Tang ho vacha kimeta dyakshamiti. Satagum ho vacha kimeta dyakshamiti. He asks this question. What is this? What's going on here? What's the reality of this? Sa brahmeti ho vacha. She replied, this is Brahman. Brahmano hava vijaye mahi adhvamiti. It, is because, it was the victory of Brahman which glorified you all. It is the power of Brahman, it is the existence, consciousness, bliss, which gives existence to this universe. In Hindi they say, Satta spurti dan karta hai. Satta means existence. We all exist, just like this table. What does it exist on? What is its existence? So it's a table by itself. No, it isn't. It's wood, through and through, every bit of it. Every bit of it is that one divine reality, which gives existence to this universe. And it gives light to this universe. It's not a dead existence. We are aware. We think, we feel, we desire, we experience, we aspire, we despair. And then we see and hear and smell and taste and touch. And then we act, talk and walk and, and create and destroy. All of that consciousness behind all of that. And then all of it is moving towards fulfillment. Joy, bliss, ananda, sat, chit, ananda. So the Divine Mother uh, taught that to Indra. So tataeva vidancha kara brahmeti. And therefore Indra realized that this is Brahman. By my own nature is Brahman. I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi. So this is a sort of prototype of what's going on in the universe. 
that there is this one central reality and that's your reality. When you realize it, you'll see, I am that. So this is a very powerful story. But you see, the whole thing depends on her. Because otherwise, till that time, either we'll think that we are this material reality, that that's all that there is. There's nothing more than this. Or if we investigate more deeply, you might end up in despair, nothingness. It'll all disappear into a blank. That from there to God, from there to divinity, that transition, according to this Upanishad at least, it depends on the Divine Mother. I'm reminded of Swami Brahmananda. He was in Banaras, in Kashi. And uh, Ma Sharada, she had also gone there. And Swami Vivekananda used to call her Janto Durga, the living Durga. So she was also there in Banaras. And she sent word to Swami Brahmananda. She t told the uh, devotee, go and ask Rakhal, Swami Brahmananda, what is the need for worshipping Shakti Durga? You realize you are Brahman, you realize your true nature, you realize who am I, finished. But what, in between, what is the need for worshipping Shakti? She, she was testing him. And Swami Brahmananda replied, the keys to the realization of Brahman are in the hands of the Divine Mother. In fact, we'll see the keys to anything in this universe are in the hands of the Divine Mother. Power, wealth, life, um, protection, everything, whatever we would want in this, and including enlightenment and freedom and moksha, they're in the hands of the Divine Mother. Once, she was standing in Banaras, standing on a terrace, Swami Brahmananda and other monks were walking by below, and he saw her up there. And he was in a sort of divine mood. He started singing this extraordinary song to Durga. Shankari charone mon magno hoye raore. Shankari is Shankara Shiva. Shankari is the Divine Mother, uh, Uma or um, uh, Parvati and Durga. So, oh my mind, remain absorbed at the feet of the Divine Mother. Shankari charone. Shankari. Divine Mother, Charane at in the feet, Magno Hoye be absorbed. Eighteen Shangshar Miche, these three worlds are appearances, they are mere illusion. Three worlds, the world of the waking, which we are inhabiting now. When you sit quietly in meditation or we fall asleep and dream, that's the world of the mind, the subtle world. And beyond that is the causal world of Maya. All are appearances. Teen Shangshar Miche. In vain do you roam around in these worlds. Because you will never find fulfillment here. The beautiful lines. He danced and he sang. Actually, we had a teacher in our monastery, Swami Jushtanandaji, who, who has passed away. And so... He used to teach us Vedanta, but he was deeply devotional. And he would sing and dance this song. So we would always sort of instigate him to sing this. Right? Maharaj, this song, please sing this. And or somebody would start singing. And inevitably he would get carried away and he would stand and dance. There's actually a small video clip somebody took of him. So, um, while the song was being sung, he is dancing. Uh, so he used to be this uh, huge man. He looked a little bit like Swami Brahmananda. Huge man, all round. <laughs> and we would tell him to control his weight and he would say no I'm not overweight it's all these skinny people who are jealous of me you know <laughs> so, but that did him in, 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 in the end but anyway he would sing and dance so beautiful words um, this life actually if you would see what it is and we'll see later on what, what this life actually is Shukher Nodi, it's a river of bliss. Sail gently through it. Dhire dhire bawaare. This is a, actually, if you live on the bank of the Ganges, on the Ganga, you will see these little boats which float by very silently, especially at night when the river is dark, you can't see much. You will see a little dot of light gliding over the waters. It's actually a little lamp burning in that boat and that boat is going. And there are, uh, especially the ones which don't have engines. So they just float by. So it's like that. You live your life like that. Recognize it. You are surrounded by God. You are in the lap of the Divine Mother all the time. In the midst of joy and happiness. But more so in the midst of 
sorrow and despair, all of it is the Divine Mother when we realize that. If you don't realize that, that it's just pleasure and pain. Do you realize that, then it becomes a river of bliss. Dhire dhire baare, gently sail through this river. Shankari charane maun magna hai raare. Oh my mind remain absorbed at the, uh, at the feet of the Divine Mother. Anyway, so the point is, Uma Hemavati, the Divine Mother, she is the one who revealed the ultimate reality, Brahman, to the gods. Then the gods realized that Brahman is the ultimate reality, I am that Brahman. Of course, these are all spiritual realizations and visions and all that very, very long ago. But what about the Durga Puja that we do now? Uh, in the image and on the picture, what you see there, it's actually a picture of an image. So that this modern form of the Durga Puja, where did it start? What's the um, basis for it? So again, I'm referring to Swami Bodhatmanandji's article. So there he says that um, there was Raja Krishna Chandra, the king of Nadia in the 18th century. It's uh, recorded that he uh, regularly performed the worship of the Divine Mother in the image. But if you go further back, there's something called the Raghunandan Smriti, uh, the code of Raghunandan, uh, where how to perform different rituals are mentioned there. And there it is clearly mentioned that you perform the uh, worship of the Divine Mother in the autumn in this way, um, in an image. So it's clearly written there. And Swami Bodhatmanji goes even further back. He quotes one Sri Natha Acharya and two other sources, going all the way back to the 11th century, so a thousand years ago. There also it's mentioned that the worship of the Divine Mother is to be performed in an image. And of course, the Durga Shaptashati Chandi, if you read that, the two main characters there, there was a king called Surat and there was uh, a merchant very happily named Samadhi. <laughs> and they wanted things in this world. The king wanted a kingdom. He, he had lost his kingdom. And the merchant wanted enlightenment and freedom. And they both got it. They made this, they worshipped the Divine Mother in an image. It's mentioned there. Now, this particular image, he, he says, Swami Bodhatmanji gives a very interesting story about the iconography here. Daksha, in one of the births of the Divine Mother, she was Sati, and her father was Daksha, the king. Um, you know, so he was, the king was very fond of Vedic rituals, the fire ritual. So he would have the fire altar and perform ritual after ritual. So, the imagery is this, the fire ritual was so dear to him that the fire um, altar, the Yajna Vedi, that was Tanaya Swarupa, like his daughter. And the fire lit there was is a symbol of Shiva. So that fire becomes Shiva later and the uh, altar becomes Durga. There are ten directions around the altar. So the ten directions become her ten arms. And then, uh, he goes on to say that to perform these rituals uh, the, you uh, need wealth, enormous amount of wealth and that becomes Lakshmi. And you need a huge amount of Vedic learning to perform these Vedic rituals, Karma Kanda, that becomes Saraswati. And you need to protect it from animals and wild animals and demons and all that, so security <laughs> is given by Kartikeya the god of war. And uh, then all obstacles to the performance of these rituals have to be removed. So Ganesha, who is, uh, so that is the symbol of, which becomes Ganesha. So now you have Ganesha and Kartikeya and uh, Lakshmi and Saraswati, you can see them there. And then um, the, all the evil tendencies which have to be overcome are embodied by the demon Mahishasura. And the aggression and power required to overcome that demon is embodied by the lion, which the Devi has got her foot on that, controlling the lion and overcoming the demon. So you have this entire iconography. That's a beautiful idea. Um, of course, you will notice today in the puja, Daksha Jagya Vinashinyai. Daksha's whole fire sacrifice was actually <laughs> destroyed by her. You know the whole story, there are stories within stories, just like everything in Hinduism. 
how her husband Shiva was insulted by her father and she destroys the uh, rituals. Maybe it, one meaning might be you overcome all these uh, mechanical rituals by pure devotion to the to God, to the Divine Mother, and not so much of these elaborate rituals. So, anyway, whatever the point is, one of the names of Durga is Daksha Yagya Vinashinye, the destroyer, Maha Ghorai, the, mo the most terrible. Um, so she is the giver of all boons and protection for the for her children. The puja itself can be of three forms. Again, Swami Bodhatmanji mentions. One is that um, you do an elaborate puja, but a big image, a lot of music, a lot of food, and a lot of clo you know, like clothes are offered, saris are offered to the Divine Mother, silk and saris from Banaras and whatnot, jewels. And, um, but the actual puja, which is supposed to be done with vidhi, that means uh, the precise instructions from the Shastras, that is neglected. Uh, some poor priest does a sort of like a sideshow. The real thing is in the show and the pomp. You might say, why would that be? Uh, go and visit Calcutta. <laughs> At this time of the year. You'll be amazed to see dozens, hundreds of big, um, they're called pandals, puja pandals. Enormous images. They are all competing with each other to make a bigger and bigger image, giant images. Uh, and light shows and music and laser displays. Uh, everybody uses the latest technology and a huge cacophony of music and loudspeakers. And in one corner you'll find a poor priest desperately trying to, to do the puja. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what is called tamasic puja. Tamasic means the dark, the, the, um, the lazy way or the, uh, you know, so this is not productive of much good. So there's an injunction against doing this. If you do all of that, all the glories, all the you know the food and the music and the decorations and big image, but also do it well. The puja you do it well. So that's called a rajasic puja. I'm tra translating from the Bengali. Uh, Bidhi is accepted, and then he said, "Bairer arumbar." the external ornamentation. Both go together, it's called Rajasik. But the best is Sattvic Puja. So where the externals are reduced to a minimum, it's more a matter of the heart. That uh, there is a continuous effort to feel the Divine Presence and to take refuge in the Divine Presence, to feel the love of the Divine Mother and to love the Divine Mother. So what I'm saying here is, the whole effort in Belur Mat, our main monastery, was to make a sattvic puja. You might say, but they, it's so elaborate there. But uh, if you compare it with the other pujas outside in Calcutta, it'll be, it won't be so elaborate. That's the minimum you can do in Durga Puja. That's why it's called the Ashwamedha, the, the great puja of uh, our age. Uh, I remember Swami Ranganathanandaji, who was the 13th president of our order. So the, in our main monastery, the tradition is the pujari, the priest, uh, and the team, they will all go and take uh, permission and blessings of President Maharaj, the Swami who is the head of our order, the president of our order. So they bow down to him and say that tomorrow the puja is starting, please bless us. And Swami Ranganathanandaji, invariably he would say, make it short. <laughs> Shorten it, whatever you do here, make it short. <laughs> Cut it short. So all the, the source of all of these pujas was in our order, Swami Ramakrishnanandaji, Sashi Maharaj. So he was the one who instituted the puja of Sri Ramakrishna and many other things and he made a format for it, what should be done. And Swami Vivekananda would often tease him. The only thing I'm afraid of is that the, the bells of Sashi, Sashi is ringing the bell. <laughs> Why is he afraid? Because he feels you know, Hindus have a proclivity towards ritualism. So it can overcome and sweep away everything else. What about the Vedantic inquiry? What about the, uh, the service of humanity, the poor and suffering humanity? Uh, Swami Vivekananda wanted to concentrate on that and not on rituals. But he says, I'm afraid of Shashi's bells. <laughs> and one, once he says, I, I want to take your bells and all and throw it into the Ganga. <laughs> but it so happens that Durga Puja in our order, in Belurmat, and in our order, was started by Swami Vivekananda. Uh -huh. Yes. 
and Vivekananda writes to Josephine MacLeod here in the United States, one of his last letters towards, towards the end, he writes, from Belurmat, the main monastery there, he writes, I have started these two places, one in the Himalayas, which is the Mayavati Ashrama, without any rituals, and with, where there will be pure non-dualism, Advaita, and one here on the bank of the Ganga, the bank of the Ganges, the, the main monastery, with full-blown rituals, but of course everything done sattvically, uh, you know, in, in a very pure devotional mood, but with all traditional Hindu rituals. And then he says, let us see how it goes. <laughs> it's an experiment. <laughs> he loved to do this. He started that, and it, it goes on like that now, even now. If you go to Mayavati in the Himalayas, it's, it's absolutely tranquil, one of the quietest places. Some kind of acoustic speciality is there in that. It's a valley, not too high, about 5,000 feet up in the Himalayas. That's the area where Jim Corbett and all the hunted tigers, Champaran and all that, so that's the area. And it's so quiet. I don't know what's with that valley. At night, I would just step outside the monastery, which I later heard was not a wise thing to do because there are leopards and bears outside. Uh, and I was advised to lock my door firmly. <laughs> I thought they were joking until the next day they found uh, the pug marks of leopards on the, in the flower beds outside. Um, anyway, I stepped outside in the dark and the Himalayan sky full of stars blazing forth. It was a uh, um, new moon night, so, so no moonlight. Full of stars, absolutely quiet, not too cold because it was summertime. And far, far away, in some other valley, there's this rare bird called the bell bird. And it sounds like, ding dong. <laughs> far away, you can hear, ding dong. And no other sound, absolutely. So that's in the Himalayas. And there are no rituals, no puja, no, not even the worship of Sri Ramakrishna. When Swami Vivekananda went there, he found the monks had already started worshipping Sri Ramakrishna there. And Swami Vivekananda's reaction was, Oh, the old man has entered here to remove his picture immediately. <laughs> and the monks were very hurt. So they complained to Masharada that they thought that she would be on their side. You know? They said, we are worshipping uh, the master, Sri Ramakrishna. What's wrong? And, and Vivekananda comes and says, remove. And they thought they will get her support. She wrote back saying, your master was non-dual. She doesn't say he was a non-dualist. He says, Tomadir Guru Chilen Adoito. That means he's Brahman. And what and therefore I can say with certainty you are all non-dualists. Therefore, what Naren has done, Vivekananda has done, is absolutely right. So that's Mayavati. But if you come from there and um, then come to Belurmat at this time, you will find right now, if you see it, that thanks to technology, you can see what's going on there right now. So it's full-fledged uh, ritualistic worship. There is Durga and the, all the devotees and monks and brahmacharis and they're all engaged in ritual after ritual after ritual, day after day after day. Uh, so it's a very elaborate ritual. Mainly it's five days. So it starts with Shashti, the sixth day uh, of the fortnight. And uh, there, uh, the, in the image, um, the, uh, the adhivasa, that means the divine presence is invoked. First, there is a pitcher of um, water which is consecrated, in that the divine presence is invoked. And then in the image, there is prana pratishta. And um, there is also, interestingly, there is a mirror. It's all very philosophical. There's a mirror in front of the divine uh, that image. And if you see, the, this, it's so small and innocuous, people miss it. That's very central. Because that's where the image is reflected. And that's what is worshipped. So when the snana is performed, the ritualistic bathing, you don't throw water on the... <laughs> it's, it's made of clay, it'll melt. <laughs> you actually bathe the mirror with the reflection of the Divine Mother. Um, so on the seventh day, what we did today, Saptami, the two days worship. So that's the general full worship is done, very elaborately. If anybody thought there was a lot of ritual, there's nothing. This is just maybe one percent of what's done. That's a hundred times more than this. And then comes the eighth day, Mahashtami, which is central. Uh, so in Durga Puja, not only the image is there, not only mantras are there, there are yantras, the sacred symbols. So one of the most powerful yantras, the Sarvato Bhadra Mandala, that is created. I'm just giving an outline of what happens. That is created on the eighth day, uh, Ashtami, Mahashtami Puja. And the worship of Durga is done in that uh, Sarvato Bhadra Mandala. It means all auspiciousness mandala. 
Um, at the end of the eight days worship, there is the most important moment of the Durga Puja, which is called Sandhi Puja. So Sandhi Puja is the conjunction. Sandhi means conjunction. Conjunction of the eighth day and the ninth day. Mahashtami and Mahanavami. Eight Ashtami and Navami. So in the traditional Indian calendar, the days are called Tithi. And they are divided into Dandas. And uh, each Danda has 24 minutes. So the Sandhi, the conjunction of the eighth day and the ninth day, um, it will be 24 minutes, the last danda of the 8th day and the first danda of the ninth day. So 24 minutes on this side and 24 minutes on that side and it's 48 minutes total. And you have to start and finish the puja in those 48 minutes. You might say that's okay. No, it's, it's elaborate. And so you have to be an expert pujari. You should see the way they race through it. It's, it's a race against time. It requires a lot of grace and dignity and dexterity and skill to move through it so well and so fast. Uh, it is the worship of Chamunda. So Divine Mother is not only uh, the giver of life, the protector, but she is also the destroyer. Uh, so Swami Vivekananda says that all good and all destruction, destruction and you know, the end of life, disease, old age, death, the destruction of, the, of um, you know, uh, hurricanes, uh, of ultimately the destruction of this universe, all of it comes from the Divine Mother. It requires a great heart to see divinity behind all of it. Uh, and so the Chamunda, she is worshipped uh, in this Sandhi Puja, in this uh, 48 minutes. Uh, you can feel the power. There is some kind of extraordinary power. Even if you see it uh, online, you will feel it. There is some, some kind of extraordinary power is felt for that period of time. Um, and it concludes with a sacrifice, Bali. And in the old days it used to be, and in some places even now, it used to be actually a goat was sacrificed. But um, it is considered to be a ghastly aff affair, so that is more or less stopped. So in place of that, a cucumber is sacrificed. It's a <laughs> big letdown, or, or, a, or a melon, or, or a pumpkin, or something like that is sacrificed. But they go through all the rituals. The priest with a shining sword which is consecrated, you think something terrible is going to happen. <laughs> And he stands up and he uh, swings the sword and, uh, and the, the Ulud Dhwani is done, that, you know, the Bengali women, they do that. So it's, it's all built up to a climax, but then there is a pumpkin which is cut. <laughs> I'm sure it's a big relief for the goats. <laughs> No, they don't do Durga Puja. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a different thing altogether. So uh, in, in Durga Puja, in some places it's still done. In some other places, in India and in Nepal, it's done. Uh, but in most places, it's not done. In Belurmat, certainly not. Uh, Swami Vivekananda was fully in favor of it. He wanted to do it. Ma Sharada said, absolutely not. You're not going to start, stop that. Uh, it's symbolic. So... I'm sure the goats would be totally on board with that. They said, you and your symbols, leave us out of it. <laughs> so it's a sacrifice of all our lower uh, impulses, tendencies, so that the divine nature can emerge and we can become liberated, enlightened. So that's the idea. Then um, there is the arati. So every day you will see the arati is performed, the evening arati of the Divine Mother. There will be uh, the priest himself and two other monks in our order who, who do the arati, three at a time. But um, this special arati at the end of the, no, the Sandhi Puja, in the 48th minute, towards the very end. So even there, the, the arati itself is so impressive. The lamp has 108 lamps. It's a giant lamp. So it might take like both hands to lift it. And uh, it's quite impressive at that point. Uh, one more thing which happens is Kumari Puja. It's in the, the worship of Goddess Durga, not just in the image, but uh, in a little girl who is selected for that and she is worshipped as the Divine Mother. Um, so Kumari Puja. And um, then there is the Navami, the ninth day. There the Homa is performed. You know the old Vedic uh, fire sacrifice, so that is performed there. And then uh, Dashami is Vijaya. It's a day of victory, the final day, and the image is immersed. First of all, ritualistically. The real immersion is when the, uh, the mirror that is immersed in a bowl of water, and you are supposed to go and see the reflection of the 
image in that water. So the divinity which you worshipped outside is gone back to its source, which is nothing other than the consciousness shining in your heart. So it's very, very philosophical, very symbolic there. And then the actual immersion of the image takes place. So, so to people who say, oh, the Hindus, they worship uh, objects like a clay image as God. Well, if you worship clay image as God, why would you happily throw it away <laughs> at the end of the puja? They, everybody knows that we have invoked the presence of God in that image. And then the, after the puja is over, you give the image back to the elements. It's immersed in water and it melts away into, into water, into back soil to soil, water to water, and so on and so forth. Um, <laughs> talking about Hindus worshipping images, I remember I had this very funny experience in our monastery in Belurmat many years ago. So, we have all sorts of monks. Some are very devotional. Some are very active in the sense of you know, service, schools, hospitals, and so on. Some are very um, intellectual, non-dualist. I won't tell you who that is, but <laughs> some are like that. Some are very meditative, deeply in inward. So anyway, so here's this gorgeous ritual going on. And at that time, we had a rabbi visiting from um, Jerusalem, Rabbi Alan Goshen Gottstein, an orthodox uh, Jewish rabbi. All right, so he was, he, he does a lot of uh, uh, Jewish Hindu lies and he's written good books about it. So he wanted to see the ritual, what goes on there. He was there. One of my friends, was a brilliant man, one of the most brilliant men I've met, a great mathematician, one of India's greatest living mathematicians, is a monk. But not at all given to image, and there's worship and rituals, image worship and all. So at the height of the worship, he was seen coolly walking away. And here's this Jewish man, an Orthodox rabbi, scolding him, hey, you go and sit there. <laughs> I told him, well, 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 I've seen everything now. <laughs> Here is a Jew, an Orthodox rabbi, <laughs> telling a Hindu to go and do his uh, idol worship properly. <laughs> you know, Thou shalt, shalt not worship graven images. <laughs> so, yeah. A um, little bit about the inner philosophy of it all and I'll conclude. So what's going on here in this extraordinary worship? So Vijaya Dashami is the culmination, the victory of the forces of good over the forces of evil. Um, you know, it starts with, the, the day it starts is called Mahalaya. Mahalaya, the deeper significance of it, the commentator says, Mahatam, of those noble ones, of those great ones, those, those who are seeking enlightenment, uh, chittam layam yasya uh, aste. That means where their mind gets absorbed or is um, uh, the source of their minds, which is basically consciousness. Yeah. From consciousness arises mind and sensory powers and ex experience of the universe. Now, throughout the worship of the Divine Mother, including the sacrifice of our own lower propensities and our body, mind, self, everything to the Divine Mother um, and worshipping the Divine Mother in the form of a human form of a little uh, girl and um, the Homa, everything is done. Finally, we attain victory. Victory means the manifestation of our divine nature, the eradication of evil impulses and the realization that we are Brahman. So that is called Vijayadashami. That's the inner philosophy of it all. See, this, uh, as I said earlier, this Durga Puja has Vedic roots. You find it in Rig Veda, the Devi Suktam. You find it in Keno Upanishad, Narayana Upanishad, and so on. But it is primarily a Tantric Puja. So there is, it is found in the uh, Shakti Tantras and the Shaiva Tantras. Uh, Shiva and Shakti are both involved here. The core idea here is this. Uh, Swami Bodhatma in this article, he puts it so precisely, one sentence. He says, Shakti when it inwardizes, Shakti jokhan antor mukhi hon, Shakti when it inwardizes is Shiva. Shiva when it shines outwards, turns attention outwards is Shakti. Shiva turned outwards is Shakti, Shakti turned inwards is Shiva. Sri Ramakrishna said, Shiva and Shakti are one and the same truth. Aki tattva, Shiva and Shakti. Uh, what you call Brahman, I call Kali. He used to uh, tell others. What does this mean? The 
term, there's a term Bhairava. Shiva is called Bhairava and Shakti is called Bhairavi. Bhairava, uh, the, in the Kashmiri Shaiva tradition, the three letters, it's a, they are very mystical things, uh, but deep philosophy is involved here. Three letters, Bha, Ra, Va. Bha, the first part of the name Bhairava, Bha means Bharanath, that which supports, that which fills. The entire universe exists because it's filled with what? Existence, which is Brahman, Sat. We are able to have all these experiences of because of what? Because Brahman is consciousness, because of our con consciousness. We, that's why we are having all these experiences. And we all find meaning, purpose, we are moving towards uh, some kind of fulfillment, goal of life. That is Ananda, bliss. So this is Bharana. Just all of this is contained in the one letter Bha. Then Ravanath, Ra. Ra here comes from Ravana, that means to absorb it all back inside. It all, the all names and forms, all living beings, non-living beings, planets and stars, quarks and quasars, they all disappear back into pure existence and awareness. That is called Ravana. And then Va is for Vamana, for projection. So when, and it is again projected as a, a, a universe. So Bhairava. Bharava means Srishti Stiti Pralaya. Um, Va is Srishti, uh, Ra is Pralaya, and Bha is Stiti. Projection of the universe, existence of the universe, and ultimate reabsorption or destruction of the universe. Another way Bhairava is explained by Abhinava Gupta, the great Kashmiri um, uh, Shaiva philosopher and saint. He says Bhairava means, has, has three aspects. One is Shrashta, the one who projects this universe. Then second is Vishwarupata, the one who appears as the universe. It's not that there is a God, someone called Shiva, and here is this universe. No, no. That God is alone appearing as everything and everybody here. Vishwarupata. And then third is Prashama. We normally say pralaya in Sanskrit, dissolution of the universe, destruction. No, it's not, it's not destruction. Prashama is quietness, sinking back into its source, prashama. Like a fire slowly is extinguished, the, fire, the universe is like a fire burning slowly extinguished back into its source. He says, into the, um, into the light of Mahabodha, or the flames of Mahabodha. What is Mahabodha? Consciousness. Awareness, pure awareness. The entire universe sinks back, disappears, fades away into awareness itself. So this is the meaning of Bhairava. Now Bhairava and Bhairavi, Shiva and Shakti are always together as the transcendent, here's a crucial idea, transcendent immanent God. Swami Vivekananda said, we Hindus worship a transcendent immanent God. What is transcendent? Beyond time, space and the universe, there is some God. Not this changing world, not the living beings, non-living beings, not this troubled, diseased, um, destructible, perishable world. One perfect existence untouched by this world, transcendent, Shiva. And yet, yet, that very reality is immanent in and through this world. Right here, what appears to be a living being and non-living entities, what appears to be the vast universe and tiny atoms and protons, uh, a little um, a fish in the, in the ocean and the great whales, all of them, this ever-changing display of, bountiful display of life and creation and destruction, all of it is immanent in this, is pervading one divine reality. That transcendent reality is right here. How is that possible? And that is the whole story of Indian philosophy. Entire schools have arisen on that. Parinamavada, the process of change of the absolute into the uh, relative world. Vivartavada, change cannot be there. The absolute must remain absolute. It can only appear as this illusion of the universe. Vivartavada, Ad Advaita Vedanta, Shankara Advaita Vedanta. All of these philosophies. But basically the idea is, the ultimate reality is here. It's now and it's you. So that's the immanence of the reality. That immanence is called Shakti. Transcendence, Shiva. Immanence, Shakti. And the two are the same. Shiva and Shakti together. Bhairava and Bhairavi together. You know what it's like? I'll just give a little hint and stop. 
it's like when you see this, uh, you know a range of pottery in pottery barn you know like uh, um, pots and jars and urns and all so that's names and forms and functions each pot is different from the other the sizes are different shapes are different names are different this is a pot that's a jar and that's something else and when you see it as clay yeah. it's clay top bottom outside inside it's just clay what do you have to do to the pots to make it clay I mean immediate nothing yes somebody has done a lot of advaita here <laughs> the immediate answer might be oh you have to smash it into a lump of clay no it's clay as it is what do you have to do to turn this lectern into wood nothing but one thing you have to do change your drishti nothing you have to do to this it's perfect as it is your drishti means point of view perspective you see it with the eyes of name form and function this is a lectern what's it called lectern what does it look like this what does it do the swami comes and bores us with long talks here <laughs> that's its function so there is a function vyavahara there is a name um, a label put to it nama and there is a form rupa when you look at nama rupa vyavahara it's a lectern that is shakti drishti same reality appears in this way and when you say it is wood through and through you touch it it's wood that's why we don't say touch lectern we say touch wood we know it's through and through wood the top of it is wood the sides of it is wood inside it's wood and the all through every bit of it is wood you don't have to do anything to it just change your perspective it's wood and only wood so wood drishti that is shiva not that seeing everything is wood then you'll say you're a wooden headed student <laughs> <laughs> this entire universe if you say universe drishti men and women and life and death and achievement and failure rise and fall of civilizations and one little life of a flower which is buds and blooms and withers and fades away from there to entire civilizations rising and falling uh, all of that is shakti drishti and you see it as shiva drishti and it is all one existence consciousness bliss which you are so you just change of drishti and this is in kashmiri shaivism it is the bhairava opening its eyes when the bhairava opens its eyes it is shakti drishti the universe appears name roop and name form and function and when the bhairava closes its eyes in meditation then it's shiva drishti it's one consciousness existence bliss when now not at the end of the universe Many people think, "Oh, it was God at the beginning of the universe, and at the end of the universe will be God again." No, no, no! It's God now. It's not like it was wood earlier, and then when this will be smashed and sold off for scrap, then it will be wood. No, it's it's wood right now. It's a wrong thing to say it was wood earlier. Now it's a lectern. Later one day it will be firewood or some scrap wood or something like that. No, no, no! Even when it's a lectern, it's wood and nothing but wood. then what is this form and the name and the function this is called maya this is a very profound thing to understand right here you can see shakti right here you can see shiva this shiva and shakti are right here the change is not in the external world change is in our drishti now one caution it's not as easy as that one might say that oh so i am seeing shak shakti now i didn't know that <laughs> no unfortunately not we are seeing a material universe until enlightenment comes you are not seeing either shakti or shiva nothing yeah. you say oh when i close my eyes in meditation i'll see shiva no you just see darkness and you'll fall asleep <laughs> and when you open your eyes you will see a world filled with trouble trouble and anxiety and desire and temptation and fear yeah. that's our material perspective that's our unenlightened perspective yeah. shankaracharya just puts it in half a sentence <laughs> ज्ञान ज्ञान ये ओहो सर्वम उपपत्ते हे ऑल ऑफ दिस बिकम्स क्लियर इफ यू लुक एट इट फ्रॉम द पर्सपेक्टिव ऑफ नॉलेज एंड इग्नोरेंस इन द वर्ल्ड ऑफ इग्नोरेंस द वर्ल्ड पीपल एंड फॉर द एनलाइटन बीइंग्स इट इज शक्ति द प्ले ऑफ शक्ति एंड व्हेन दे विथड्रॉ देयर माइंड इनटू देयर इनर रियलिटी इट इज शिवा इट इज द सेम थिंग फाइनल वर्ड दिस शिवा एंड शक्ति अद्वैत वेदांत सेस तत्वमसि this extraordinary tattvam this this extraordinary reality 
the most profound secret of all our universe, everything that we have done life after life, most profound secret is you, your own innermost reality. However, the Divine Mother is the giver of not only this enlightenment, the keys to enlightenment in our hands, but also Dharma Artha Kama Moksha. Those who want pleasure in this world, have a good time, party. Worship the Divine Mother, you will get what you want. Those who want to be rich and powerful in this world, worship the Divine Mother, you will get what you want. And those who want to be good people, ethical, do good in this world, transform society, social justice activist, worship the Divine Mother. By her protection, your uh, plans will come to fruition. You will be blessed with success. And if you want the grandest of all goals, the final uh, Parama Purushartha, the great goal of all human life, God realization, worship the Divine Mother. She will grant you with that, too, that, that also. And till that time, she will protect us. Uh, when we want her, uh, she will take us on her lap and free us from samsara. When we don't want, it's not that the child never wants the mother, but the child may be engaged in play. So Sri Ramakrishna put it this way, when the baby is engaged in play, the mother is busy with her work. But when the baby throws its toys, her, his or her toys away and wails, Ma, then the mother puts all work aside and rushes and takes the baby on her lap. So as long as you want to play, you can play. The mother will give us toys to play with. You don't want the toys anymore and you say, Ma, <laughs> then she will come and take us on her lap. We pray to the Divine Mother for her protection, for her blessings. We are her children from lifetime to lifetime. And she is guiding us. She is taking us, whether we know it or not, she is taking care of all of us. It will be all well in the end. And the most amazing thing is, we will realize it was all well all throughout. I pray to the Mother, to Sri Ramakrishna, to Masharada Devi, to Swami Vivekananda, to bless all of us and protect all of us. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Parnamastu